Super. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and welcome to this divisional webinar on what is a cold evening in Joburg and across the country. Uh, my name is Sipo Jam. I am the, sorry. I, uh, my name is Sipo Jamini. I am the current chair of the South African Association of Counseling Psychologists, uh, Division of SISA. Uh, thank you all again for joining us today uh, for this webinar entitled Working in Public. Working uh, Counseling Psychology in the Public Health System in Bertrand Corners. Um, I'm glad to see so many of you were able to attend today uh, with load shedding uh, still gripping us across the country. Um, sorry, I'm hearing someone. Someone's saying there's no sound. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear you, but we lose you at times. So I don't know if you just want to check your mic. Okay, maybe I'll try to come closer to the screen. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, oh. we can. Super, thank you. All right, uh, again, uh, my name is Sipo Zameni. I'm the current chair uh, for the South African Association of Counseling Psychologists at SISA. Uh, so I just wanna do a quick introduction for everyone before we let our speakers begin. Uh, so I just want to uh, mention the other executive members for the division. Um, Dr. Obama Gola, who is the vice chair. I'm not sure if he's here tonight, uh, but he's the current vice chair of the division. Uh, Ms. Uh, Geraldine Francis, who is uh, the secretariat and treasurer for the division. Uh, and we have uh, Sharon Melrose, uh, who's an additional member for the division, uh, and uh, Genevieve Barrow, who's also uh, an additional member, and uh, Mobile Mson, who's also an additional member for the executive. So just to thank them uh, for all the efforts in putting this together uh, today. So before we start, uh, I would like to just say to all the division members who are here with us today and all those who are potentially division members to note that this year is an elective year for the executive, which means the current term of the current executive ends this year at the end of the Congress in October, the SISA Congress in October. I'd like to encourage all of you to either nominate yourself at the AGM, which is to be announced uh, soon, or nominate a colleague who can stand for any one of the positions that are available within uh, the divisional executive. Uh, the current uh, division executive will send out uh, a notice for when the AGM is gonna happen, how a nomination process will work through the SISA office. So to please look out for that and please participate. Uh, as the executive of the divisions are quite important, not just for hosting these lovely events, but also for the work that we do behind the scenes, uh, letters that get written to the board, communication across uh, various stakeholders, uh, and of course, the contribution to uh, the livelihood of SISA as a whole uh, through sitting in council and so on and so forth. So to please participate, uh, I beg, I urge everyone to do so. Uh, the current executive has been, has been around for quite a bit and would like to get other people with new ideas, new ways going forward, as we will come to see uh, with how we frame this particular um, workshop, some big changes happening within the sphere of uh, health in this country uh, in particular. And it is important and imperative for all of us as psychologists uh, to have our voices heard. And SISA is one of those and probably one of the most important ways in which to do so. Uh, 
with that said, um, I would also like to alert everyone that the draft Congress uh, um, schedule is out. Please have a look at that. The CISA Congress that's to happen in October, the, the, the draft uh, programs out. Please have a look at that. Uh, it looks fun. It looks uh, very engaging with interesting, as always, presentations. To also note, that there are three more workshops in the series uh, in which you can also pick up CPD points for, such as this one. Uh, three more workshops to come uh, before, uh, before Congress happens. Uh, I hope I'm still clear. I'm seeing uh, Ingrid saying that they can't hear me or there's no sound. I'm still audible, yes? Yes. Very good. Um, so three more workshops, one, another one is happening, which is hosted by, um, by our sibling division, the clinical division uh, tomorrow in CBT. You can attend that, it'll be great around the same time, six o'clock and two other ones on forensic and uh, neuro, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you can attend those. And the CPD link, uh, for this workshop will be posted at the end of the workshop in the chat. So you can click that, fill it in, and your CPD points will be allocated to you accordingly. Okay, that's all the administrative stuff uh, to get on to, um, to get on to, uh, just a moment, just check. A couple of people are saying they have no sound. I'm not sure why. Um, but it means I'm still audible, but I'm not sure why they can't hear anything. Before everything's working, there is sound, everything's on track. Okay. All right. So as I've said, uh, a number of changes are forthcoming within, <clears throat> within the arena of health in this country, health broadly defined here, which, uh, which should have an impact on a number of sectors, including the education sector. Uh, for which one of our speakers uh, works currently uh, and other spheres, including work and so on and so forth. So I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, the National Health Insurance Bill or the NHI Bill, as, as it is commonly known, that was passed by Parliament uh, about a month ago, <clears throat> or at least that has passed, um, yes, that has passed Parliament, that was uh, voted and passed in Parliament. Uh, about a month ago, which officially kickstarts the introduction of the national health insurance, which will have huge implications. So much chatter over the past, at least past decade, there's been a lot of chatter around the NHI and its implications <clears throat> and people uh, who, who stand against it and some are for it. And CISA is an organization uh, for a very long time has been engaged with parliament around in particular the role of psychologists within the NHI system. So they, although today's presentation is not specifically on the NHI, what we are attempting to do here is to talk a little bit about the role of counseling psychologists as a registration category within, uh, within the public health system. That is a state funded slash taxpayer funded health system. Given the fact that uh, the NHI intends on a universal coverage, that is everyone will be covered under the NHI uh, with particular caveats that are listed within the NHI that I won't go through um, in danger of boring people will, um, in danger of boring people with nitty gritty policies. However, I do, I do urge everyone here uh, along with other colleagues who, who may not be able to be here to, to look at the NHI bill and to look at the implications that will come. It is going to be a slow process in the beginning according to uh, the Minister of Health, and then it should be fast tracked as particular administrative processes are put in place. So today we invited two speakers to speak to us about the role of counseling psychologists within the public health system to speak to us about the work that they have been doing in the years, many, many years of experience, not to say that I was 
speakers are old, but they've had many years of experience within um, within the within the public health system. So what we will do is that we'll have our first speaker and then we'll have our second speaker and then we'll take some questions. So please post your questions on the chat, which should be found at the bottom of the link there or the Q&A, you can post there and we'll take them and we'll present them to the speaker. So if you can note them there, uh, if you have questions for the first speaker and I will, I will ask the speaker at the end of both presentations to engage with those questions and answers. Please engage. This is an opportunity, uh, at least for many of us uh, who, who have been thinking about working in the public health system, to think through what role we may partake in that. So our first speaker is Dr. Irval Cruz, uh, who is Western Cape Education Department Senior Psychologist and a Provincial Program Coordinator for School Psychological Services. Uh, this presentation, uh, Eval says, uh, draws from his personal experiences working as a counseling psychologist in both national and international governments. He called Lamini, so he's proceeding. Sorry? Okay, I'm back. Um, so to please note to everyone to please mute your mic uh, and if you have a question that you'd like to ask at the end of the presentations to please put your hand up the hand up function is under reactions so you can press there it's a low hand and we'll take your question um, so Ewald, uh says that he will unpack the multifaceted challenges faced by counseling psychologists in delivering mental health services, but ah, also the issues in uh, He will also address employment and recruitment challenges often encountered, uh, the need to align counseling psychology training programs with what to expect as a public servant is discussed and examples are given to illustrate areas of consideration. So he will explore some innovative interventions, collaborative practices, and the integration of technology to enhance service delivery. Uh, Ewald, over to you. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I always um, get slightly anxious when there's an introduction like this, uh, and I find myself hearing the information and saying, is, is that truly a reflection of who I am? Uh, but yeah, it's it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here and uh, just smiling, looking at all the the familiar names that I see running across the screen and, and uh, hoping that I can see, share some information with you that's uh, of value to, to counseling psychologists and messages that I think uh, we as a psychology fraternity need to hear. Uh, so hopefully it will all um, yeah, run according to plan. And uh, if, if it's okay, then I'll start sharing my presentation with you. Mohamed, can I just get confirmation that the the presentation is visible? Yes, it is, Erald. Right, so to me, when I was asked to do a, a talk on, on counseling psychology, the, the whole notion of, of navigating a pretty complicated uh, sector came to, came to mind. And, you know, this is, it's, it's all about connecting experiences that we've got. But it offers an opportunity for me also to reflect at the journey that I've traveled. Now, as an early career psychologist, many, many years ago, I think I qualified in 2006, walked across the stage, I did ask this question, where do I see myself in 20 years time? Most likely many of, of the people here on the call today have asked that same question. Some might be at the beginning of the career, while others are near the end, but we all ask that question. And today is close to 17 years uh, to the date when I first asked this question. And indeed, I can say that many of the choices that I made have led me closer to where I wanted to be or where I wanted to, to see myself working in the future. 
But if I have a true conversation with myself and say, you know, have I reached all the goals that I've identified for myself? I have not. But that does not mean that we don't have uh, you know, more opportunities to achieve what we, we want to achieve. I find myself incredibly fortunate to be in, in Cape Town working at head office. And I thought maybe I'd see the journey that I traveled um, and it could help some people just understand some of the complexities and the frustrations that there are inherent to the occupation and look at opportunities that there are still in the field. So as I said, 2006 uh, got that tap uh, you know, saying that you are now a psychologist and immediately we think that you know the world is our oyster and we'll go out there and we'll find employment all over the place and life is just going to be absolutely breezy. The reality is that soon after qualification, you know, you have to write your board exam. And uh, what I could find was work at a NGO. And I worked as a counselor basically at an outreach service for HIV patients within the Southern Cape region. I earned very close to what I earned as a psychology intern. So this massive jump in salary that was promised or that people perceived was not really the case, but very fortunate and gained great experiences. From here, I moved towards education. Again, that's where the work was. And I started to work as a contract psychologist for the Western Cape Education Department working in George. Now at that stage, you had one psychologist for plus minus 30,000 kids. And again, having to provide um, psychological services ranging from individual support all the way to, to training. In 2012, I opened up a private practice. I was busy with my PhD uh, and started to experience the, the need for something else than just the one-to-one -one type of approach that um, I think psychology often leads to. Uh, wonderful experiences then joined Organized Psychology and became a SISA member in 2012. Now, this is really relevant. And I, I do believe that our voice as counseling psychologists needs to be amplified by collectively joining organized psychology organizations, such as SISA. In 2016, you'll see that that next marker is in red. And this was the first time that I actually got a permanent position, my first permanent position close to 10 years after quali qualifying as a psychologist. Uh, in 2016 to 2019, experienced the, the difficulties of public service uh, and started to look at, you know, what are the other opportunities? You know, the questions that we always ask ourselves, but, you know, surely there's more to life. Uh, this can't be it. Where are the opportunities? So I um, had a bit of a stint in, in New Zealand, working as a psychologist from 2019. And then close after that, I was promoted to become a service manager. And this is working for the Ministry of, Ministry of Education in New Zealand. Uh, and that is a, a, almost a coordination function or coordinator function uh, where you work with a multidisciplinary team. And then an opportunity opened up, again, a position within Western Cape government. And this was the head office uh, position for senior psychology and the program coordinator. And that's the position that I currently hold. And what you see on screen is basically breadcrumbs. Those experiences are really relevant because I think in the psychology role that we see, we realize that the experiences that we um, yeah, experience shape the practitioner. And I think in turn, the practitioner evolves. So even though at the age of 24, when I qualified as a psychologist and you had ideas about where you want to be in the future, those dreams were shaped before I actually had experiences as a psychologist. Now this is the same um, almost template of experiences. But what I wanted to illustrate to you now is why there was a need to move from these different positions and why they are relevant. And at each stage, what I was actually facing was a challenge within psychological services. Working in the NGO, for me, it was being challenged with having absolutely no resources and working in a rural setting. The next challenge was working for government, but being completely overwhelmed with the request for services and the managers that actually didn't understand psychological services. 
when I moved into private practice, I very quickly realized that diversity of income is a prerequisite for being successful. We can't only rely on your walking clients or your one-to-one -one engagements for, uh, for a successful you know, career. So then started to think about what's the other approaches that I can follow or could follow, uh, which included, you know, in-service training and, and, and you know, workshops and, and um, support like that. When I worked as a senior psychologist within Cape Winelands, the difficulty that I had within school psychological services was ensuring equitable access to psychological services in the rural settings. Often our psychologists, you know, locate themselves within city centers. Uh, that's where it's comfortable to stay. However, that's often not where the need is. And this is the journey abroad. Uh, and the lesson that, or the, the challenge that I was confronted there was, just because things work, does not mean that school psychological services or psychological services are better utilized. And that was a, a real key lesson that I learned. In the service manager position, again, challenged with rigid thinking and only focusing on behavior management. So psychologists working for the Ministry of Education uh, in New Zealand only does one thing, behavior management. And I, again, felt that, you know, that's not appropriate utilization of the skill set that we bring to the table. Looking forward to uh, uncovering what the challenges are within my position at head office now in Cape Town. But I'm hoping that you can see that part of the skill set that we as counseling psychologists bring to the table is the ability to use difficult situations and guide our decision making going forward. The here and the day, counseling psychology 2019 to me was faced with a whole lot of challenges. Um, I felt um, disillusioned. I felt that, you know, there's more to life. And I felt as a practitioner that, you know, I wanted to experience something else. I wanted to experience a system that worked. And the, the grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, analogy was one that I followed and ended up in New Zealand. And this was a wonderful experience. Uh, just to have that international experience and, and see how public service works. Um, really brought a perspective to, to my decision-making that I would not have had if I didn't go and, and spend some time abroad. What I wanted to show you is what you see on screen is the kids that we work with in public service. Uh, top screen, you'll see Avian Park, that's in Worcester. And those are the, the kids that we had to support uh, in, in Worcester and in, in the Western Cape Education Department. It's, these are not actual clients, these are, publicly available images, but just want to give you an idea of the, the faces of the kids. And the picture below is Sunnyvale. And this is in Henderson, an area really struggling with uh, you know, poverty, uh, poor socioeconomic conditions. And, and again, you see the, the range of kids. So as a psychologist working within public service, what are we facing? What did I face? What did I experience? So high prevalence of domestic violence and children's exposure to adverse childhood experiences. Limitations in access to health care. Substance use and abuse, a major concern in communities. And these are direct quotes from, um, from our, our school, school principals and learning support coordinators. School absenteeism, dropouts are challenging to address because of the fact that many parents do not want to engage with support. And suicide rates in school-aged children have increased substantially over the last three years. And this was in reference to COVID. Now, when I speak to people about these, uh, these challenges that we encounter as psychologists, I always ask the question, are we speaking about the, the New Zealand population? Or are we speaking about the, the population in South Africa? And the, the summary that you've just seen is from New Zealand. What is always interesting, and this is something that I reflect on fondly, is that the support offered by a psychologist is valued. The client never asked about the category of registration. Not once in working as a service manager, working as a psychologist, not once did the client, the school, the teacher, the child, the family ask, please tell me what is your category of registration? And I think that's, that's relevant. 
So for the child, for the client, for the parents, this might be an example of, of need. I need someone to help me understand my emotions. Someone that can help me make sense of why I do things differently. Someone to help me see the good in me. I need you, referring to the psychologist. And if we take away the emotion around registration categories and scope of practice and, and the battles that we've previously faced, we realize that counseling, educational, and clinical psychologists have a role to play. Asking for us to be involved. And I think our, our focus is always on, on the child. But what has happened because of the battles faced, we bring a, a whole lot of emotions to the table. And we struggle to see the needs of our, our children. And we bring a whole lot of uh, emotions to the table. And I think as a practitioner, there is a lot of hurt. There's a, a lot of anger and frustration and even resentment that many people carry with them. And knowing that and working in public service, what I want to tell you is that scaling psychological services means that we all need to agree that the need far outweighs the supply. We need to combine our efforts to support our most vulnerable learners. I'm hoping that you, you hear it from my heart today because in government, we are desperately looking for psychologists to put up their hand and say, I'm willing and I'm able to become part of public service. So I want you to go back to uh, Psychology 101 and think about you know, walking into your first lecture and the idea about psychology and you know, the world of psychology, where we'll practice, where we'll find work, and the training models that uh, we often encounter within undergraduate programs. Well, um, a couple of days ago when I was you know, getting images for this presentation, I ran a search for psychology. And what you see on screen is basically just a summary, a collage of what um, uh, stock graphics say psychology involves. So to me, it looks like there's a whole lot of holding clipboards, you know, holding hands, uh, some concern being noted, a couple of hand gestures. Um, and if this is your perception of, of psychology, then don't apply for a position in public service. This is not the world of mental health services in the public sector. It doesn't mean that it's not rewarding. It just means it's different. So what are we facing today in public service? We face classes like this, where in this class, we've got a range of different learners with a range of different support needs. We might have learning disabilities in this group. We might have children experiencing traumas, uh, significant poverty, absenteeism, you know, domestic violence. And all these things are impacting on learning, a key skill set for these kids to grow and develop their future. So as a psychologist coming to the table, we have to bring in something else, maybe something that we haven't even been taught, but we've got the ability to research and find information and bring that to the table. Here's another group of kids. And within the, the policy world, it's all about early identification. So how is it possible for a psychologist to come in with the SIs or IQ test um, and provide the support that's needed for this group of kids, because we're not talking about one child, we're talking about multiple children in serious need. And never overlook the teachers in the classroom. Possibly that is where our focus needs to go. Helping teachers uh, deal with some of the significant stresses that they deal with, uh, the pressure on a teacher to get through curriculum, um, always educational change. So it's a, it's a rich, rich and complex world for us as, as psychologists, but absolutely worthwhile. So what are some of the complexities of public service? Yes, we do have re uh, resource constraints. Absolutely, it is a high demand. The prevalence of trauma, violence, poverty, psychosocial stresses, all these things are having an impact. We need to have cultural sensitivity. Um, often our training programs means that you know we, we work outside of an area that we are uh, competent or feel comfortable in but we've we've got the ability to connect and to, to speak with with our colleagues and and just make sure that we we sensitize ourselves um, and being mindful of of working in a environment 
that's not known to us. So that's really important. We might have language barriers. We've got trauma and complex cases. Um, and again, emphasizing access to remote areas is, uh, is something that we, we as public servants are always mindful of. We always work together with other departments. And even though your department might be functioning pretty well, it doesn't mean that your sister department, the Department of Social Development or police is functioning that well, but it's being mindful of the fact that we are all you know, working towards the same goal. We've got professional burnout, of course. And again, one area that I find myself doing a lot of work in at the moment is policy and administrative hurdles. How can I create the space for psychologists to work in public service, feeling safe and feeling that they are supported? Despite all those complexities, I want to say that the clients actually don't care. As long as the services is needs driven and demonstrates a level of competency, whether or not you're a clinical, counseling, educational, or abroad, they've got generic um, psychologists, it's all about providing the service. So if you work for Western Cape government or even for the Department of Basic Education, what might you find and experience? So what you see on screen is the list of um, disabilities, of barriers to learning that we most often work with. So the entire range of intellectual disabilities, ADHD, communication disorders, autism spectrum disorder, which is a hot topic at the moment within public service, uh, specific learning disorders, got the behavior disorders, uh, medical conditions, chronic conditions, fetal alcohol syndrome, traumatic brain injury, educational problems. So a wide range of, uh, of concerns that I do think that counseling psychologists are, are wonderfully positioned and placed to provide support for. So where's the, where's the challenge? Here we've got somebody, just a, a recently qualified psychologist saying that, you know, I'm just not being shortlisted. I want to work for education. I've got my CV ready. Uh, just, I'm just not being invited to for shortlisting. So a note from the employer is that your registration category might actually have nothing to do with it. Uh, and I hope to share a little bit of insight here to, with you today. Very typical. Um, most of you have been in the interview and this is a ideal scenario somebody who desperately is looking for work has got a cv prepped um, and looking for employment and here we've got an employer desperately looking for somebody that can fit into the organization and hit the ground running and do what they are expected to do but what do we see many people applying for positions within government is pretty desperate in finding employment so what happens is uh, I'll submit applications wherever I see a vacancy advertised. So we see very generic uh, applications being submitted for consideration. We're seeing uh, CVs that get submitted is not tailored towards the position applied for, uh, a one size fits all approach. And applying for a position uh, without doing the necessary search is, um, yeah, you need to know or at least do a little bit of research to see if there's alignment between you as a practitioner and the service where you are applying for a position. So if this is the case, as an employee asking for an opportunity, the employer, remember, they don't see you. The first thing that they see is your CV. And what the panel sees is this, generic applications, lack of research, ignoring the South African context, and limited experience. And we'll speak about the limited experience a little bit later on. The lived experience of so many notes from employers, your registration category might actually have nothing to do with it. It could just be that we need to spend some time and really make sure that when we apply for a position, that we tick all the boxes. Uh, hopefully I can share some, some insight to, uh, to what you can do. So reflecting on our reflections, there's absolutely a space for counseling psychologists within public service. I speak on behalf of the Western Cape Education Department, um, and I do think that many of the concerns that were previously noted or identified has been addressed. They've not all been addressed, but there has been significant progress made. Many of the roadblocks that impede our journey 
have been removed. For example, previously the perception that only, account, uh, only educational psychologists are employed by the Western Cape government, that's not the case. So I can confirm you with you that WCD employs counseling psychologists, clinical and educational psychologists. They need to have a counseling uh, uh, you know, component as part. So that's why research doesn't form part of, uh, of the job. Uh, or, or the people that can get uh, appointed, but all three categories, counseling, clinical, and educational psychologists, we've got active employment for. Another point here is that only psychologists with teaching qualifications are employed by the WCD, and that was previously the case. That has changed. So again, we are employing psychologists, so counseling, clinical, and educational psychologists. There are a couple of self-imposed uh, self roadblocks that we need to address. And these are, if you take a look on screen, just yesterday we did a round of shortlisting. And this is before we even look at the CV, this is what we need to uh, be mindful of. A master's degree in psychology. You see no specification there into what uh, form of psychology. Registration and proof of current um, with the Health Professions Council of South Africa as a psychologist. Again, no uh, registration category is noted there. The next one is the curveball. Registration with the South African Council of Educators, SACE. We need a driver's license and we need three refer referees. So why is that number three such a, such a curveball? If you take a look on screen, if you get employed within Western Cape government or within a public service setting uh, for education, you get employed under the Educators Act. And because that is the case, we have to be registered with, with SAIS. Now, previously, uh, a education qualification was necessary to be registered with SAIS, but SAIS has also done a bit of research. And if you take a look at point two on screen, uh, the second highlighted yellow point, that's where the therapists with a valid HPCSA registration are accommodated as per employee's recommendation at school or institution. So if you are intending to apply for a position in education, get onto the SAIS website and register yourself as a, um, a SAIS, uh, yeah, for SAIS registration. It takes forever, but you'll see as soon as we get to e-recruitment, you can at least then say, I have applied for registration with SACE. And that's enough. The registration doesn't have to be completed. Just the application itself endorses you as uh, being on this journey. So that's the, the first uh, point that I want to make you today is, if you are intending to apply for position uh, in, in education, please apply for SACE registration. The second one is where do we find information about psychology positions? Again, I'm only speaking on behalf of the WCED. They've got an e-recruitment system. After this workshop, I can uh, send the information to, to the CISA office and it can be disseminated. But this is where the information gets loaded. Yeah, it's, it's not a perfect system. It's tricky. Uh, it needs a little bit of, of guidance every once in a while. But this is where the information is sitting. We are desperately looking for counseling psychologists. We're desperately looking for any psychologists that's willing and able to work in public service. If you want, I'm just gonna get into the end of the, the presentation. Uh, this is my LinkedIn profile. If you want to just go to my LinkedIn profile, send a, a, a request for the next 24 hours, I'll just accept those requests and I'm, I'm gonna make the connection that you attended this particular uh, presentation. Because on this LinkedIn profile, I often just release the, the positions that we get advertised. We've got another position that is uh, open for, for applications, and I'll be posting that um, early tomorrow morning. So I'm at the end uh, of the presentation. Just wanted to, to say that you know these breadcrumbs, going back to the Hansel and Gretel analogy, I'm here today, but I want to look back and and see the journey that I traveled. The uh, opportunities are still there. There's many opportunities available, but I do think as counseling psychologists, we should play a more active role in being proactive and guiding where we want to go, as opposed to waiting for, for somebody else to make a choice as to where our services are needed. Thank you so much.
<clears throat> ah, thank, thank you, Ewald. I think your, your many years of experience uh, overseas and here um, in the country. I think for many of us, um, even for uh, early career psychologists who may want to go into um, the public, uh, public service route more generally, uh, have found this very useful. There are a few questions I can see, and, and I encourage colleagues to, to please just post your questions. I will, I will take them to Earwald. Uh, at the end, uh, at the end of the presentations of both presentations, um, I've noted them. But thank you so much, Evald. I think um, it's very insightful, even for myself. Um, disparagingly, sometimes I think oh, there's just nothing available for me um, in the public service. But this has been very eye-opening. Thank you. We'll take questions for Evald at the end. Um, for now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, and I hope that there are connections being that there are connections that colleagues will be able to make between these um, these presentations. But I would like to introduce our next speak our next speaker, uh, Dr. Farosa Kaldi, uh, who herself has been practicing as a counseling psychologist for nineteen years um, and has persisted. <laughs> for quite a long time uh, in several contexts, including private practice, uh, corporate academia, <clears throat> and NGOs, and now the public sector. Um, Farosa says this of herself, that she enjoys academia as well as the practical application of psychological theory, and is particularly interested in the question of relevance of psychological practice in societies such as South Africa that are characterized, as we know, by social disparities, uh, diversity, and multiple psychosocial challenges. Uh, in 2011, she received a recognition award from the University of Johannesburg Unit for Institutional Advancement for Community Engaged uh, Work with Master Psychology students and numerous other awards. Uh, Farosa is currently employed full time uh, with the Houting Province Department of Health uh, and is employed just next door to me here um, at Helen Joseph Academic Hospital and a joint appointee of the University of the Witwatersrand's Department of Psychiatry. And she's the program coordinator for the Counseling Psychology Internship at Helen Joseph Hospital. So Farosa brings with her a wealth of knowledge about how in particular the health system, the public health system, works in line with counseling psychologists. Um, <clears throat> Farosa, over to you. Uh, just, it's it's a little bit low. Uh, the volume is a little bit low. Um, I will just speak up a little bit. Is that okay. better? Uh, I can't see myself. Um, I wonder if you haven't switched off the, the low camera thing imaging, um, the low uh, shutter screen on the camera at the top of the laptop thing. There we go. All right. All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Evil, so much for the presentation. I really went the school. Um, uh, we've learned a lot um, just in terms of opportunities, but um, I also just want to concur with the, uh, the analogy of, of breadcrumbs. <laughs> I think it is so important to um, this, this holding on to this identity uh, while you're trying to forge some kind of way to, to make a contribution. I think I, 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 I somehow share that, that experience with you in a way that, um, yeah, somehow um, 
it, it took quite some time for it all to come together. Um, but the importance of being able to hold on to that sense of identity and, and where you see yourself and, and being proactive and looking for opportunities to uh, really realize the goals of um, all the values of counseling psychology. So I think it is tough, but, but I do think, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I, I do share um, um, that experience that, um, yeah, I've also had a very similar um, experience. It feels like the road has been very long to end up uh, where we are currently find myself. Um, okay, nevertheless, I will share um, just my screen. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the role of counseling psychologists in, um, in public health. Uh, and I'm really basing the presentation on uh, my experience as uh, working as a counseling psychologist um, in a public hospital. Um, I am just trying to remove the ribbon so that I can put the slide show. Right. Okay. Um, right. Um, Okay, so I want to start off by maybe just um, sketching um, the context of having Joseph Hospital where I am currently employed. Um, so the Department of Psychology at Joseph Hospital can basically, um, just in terms of the service offering, we can basically find it between inpatient services and outpatient services. So uh, I'm just going to give you a description of just the services that we offer. So in patient services, we have a male and female psychiatric ward, which is an acute ward. Uh, so 72 hours stay, uh, although it does happen that patients do stay longer. And this is a primary domain of the clinical psychologist. Um, then we also, in terms of inpatient services, offer bedside consultation, um, and this is in the medical wards. Um, uh, we also consult with renal patients at the bedside and sometimes uh, uh, chronic pain patients. So where I put CL, that refers to clinical psychologists, and CO is a counseling psychologist. So clinical counseling psychologists are not involved in, in the psychiatric ward. Uh, but they do do bedside consultation. They are then also they manage or they work with renal patients, with chronic pain patients. And then in terms of outpatient services, um, we have individual group therapy. So both clinical and counseling psychologists uh, work uh, with, with, with these interventions. Psychological assessment, so both clinical and counseling psychologists. And then we also have dedicated services to the pain and renal units, where um, this is primarily where counseling psychologists work. Um, also, just to mention that, you know, some of the services have been curtailed. So previously, we also had services at the HIV uh, unit of the hospital, but that has since uh, stopped. Well, not stopped completely, but just in terms of um, therapeutic services, uh, we are involved in that anymore, uh, but we do uh, still uh, do assessments there. So just in terms of the staff complement at Helen Joseph Hospital, there are four permanent clinical psychologists. Uh, there's a post for three intern clinical psychologists and one clinical psychologist. Um, two clinical community service psychologists posts currently. And then in terms of counseling psychology, there is one counseling psychologist, um, two intern counseling psychologist posts and one sessional psychologist. <laughs> Uh, sorry for us, uh, colleague. Somebody's um, <laughs> mic is on. <laughs> uh, sorry, colleagues. I think somebody's <laughs> mic is on. <laughs> uh, 
Thanks, Mohammed. Thanks for that. Uh, sorry, Faroza, just, just as we've taken a brief pause, uh, yeah. can you not use your headphones? I think there's a bit of an yeah. echo and we lose you. You come in and out. Oh, sorry, from my side. I do have my headphones on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can I can hear you now. I'm just saying that uh, if you could not use them. I oh, think. I mustn't use yeah. them. Okay, let's try yeah, that. I think that's, yeah. All right. So if you can try that. All right, I'll just speak up a little bit. It's just very soft and I don't use it. Can okay, you hear me? Super, thank you. Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. All right. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So how I've uh, structured the presentation was just to look at um, obviously the role of counseling psychologists in this particular hospital. Um, and I think as we all know, there are not a lot of positions available for counseling psychologists in the Gauteng Department of Health at least. Um, so I'm very, very interested to, to look at other provinces uh, just given um, Eval's presentation today. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping, but I don't know of many uh, positions in, in other um, uh, departments or other provinces. Um, so how I wanted or how I structured uh, the presentation was really just to look at um, the kind of services that, that the counseling psychologists specifically offer. As we know, there is a lot of overlap between what counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists do. And you'll also see that there are certainly in, in Helen Joseph Hospital setting, also that kind of setup where the counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists uh, perform uh, certain roles um, that overlap. And then there are uh, certain um, areas where um, exclusively the clinical psychologists work, which, as I've mentioned, it would be the inpatient psychiatric unit. And then there are also the areas that is specifically the domain of uh, counseling psychologists in, in the Department of Psychology at Joseph Hospital. So I've structured the presentation um, while looking at uh, the intervention, sort of grouping the interventions in a way very simplistically. Um, so um, looking at the interventions, sorry, I've lost myself now. Right, there we go. Um, grouping the interventions um, according to um, almost a theoretical framework, I want to say. Um, and using the community psychology model to just talk about the type of interventions. So a group of interventions one can describe is sort of more aligned with the medical model or uh, mainstream psychology, or even if you want to use uh, um, terminology from community psychology, the sort of mental health model of um, interventions. So these would include individual and group psychotherapy, um, participation in multidisciplinary teams, and psychological consultation and assessment. So I'll talk to those, and I will also try and mention, I will also then reflect on the spin that counseling psychology bring to these sort of more mainstream psychological interventions. Um, so, in terms of individual and group psychotherapy, uh, I, I also just want to mention that a lot of these services, because there is only me as a permanent counseling psychologist, a lot of the services are rendered by intern psychologists, with supervision being provided by um, permanent psychologists and sessional psychologists, and of course the permanent psychologists also do do uh, some clinical work as well. But you can see how already um, the resource constraints is, is, is evident. Um, so in addition to preferred choice, um, interns are encouraged to really consider therapeutic approaches that are brief, that are cost effective, that are empowering, that are based on best practices. So in addition to um, just developing the clinical skills, this is an important emphasis in the, in the internship training program. Um, also an emphasis on or um, consideration to the barriers to service utilization. I think Eval has also mentioned issues of resource constraints, language, um, as well as stigma associated with taking up psychological services. And I'll speak to that a little later on as well. 
Uh, so to, to keep that in mind, to, to be cognizant of the client population that we serve, as it is a public hospital, um, you can imagine that we really are seeing um, uh, at times people that can really be considered on the margins of society. Um, people that are, are, you know, are some of our patients um, are exposed to really object poverty. Um, our patients also uh, include uh, refugees. Um, so very often services for these individuals are very difficult to deliver. So in, in addition to just um, being able to deliver the service, we do find that certain uh, members of our, of, of our uh, population group find themselves in spaces where it's actually difficult to even access the service, although the service is there. Um, another service offering is psychoeducation and support groups. Um, this is for the pain management unit and renal unit. So basically uh, chronic people with chronic medical conditions. Um, and in the past, we also had an HIV adolescent group, which um, um, has, we, we don't offer that service anymore. But again, you can see how the emphasis is on uh, groups that are at risk um, and groups that are um, on the margins of society. Um, there's also a strong emphasis on effective case management. Um, so we also uh, work from the premise that psychotherapy is not the only psychological intervention, right? Uh, although it is still part of a sort of a medical mainstream model, but we do try and emphasize um, the importance of effective case management, helping uh, or assisting patients to navigate the health system. So very often we would, we would, patients might indicate that they simply cannot afford to come for psychotherapy. They cannot come weekly. Um, they can only come uh, for their next medical appointment, which is perhaps once a month. And we would then offer case management. And this would consist of um, helping patients navigate the health system um, helping patients with things like adherence, uh, just having that available holding space for, for patients. Then uh, the counseling psychologist, myself, the, the sessional psychologist and interns, we are part of multidisciplinary teams, specifically the uh, pain management unit and the renal unit. Uh, so in addition to patient diagnosis and context uh, sensitive treatment planning, uh, we also encourage members of the uh, disciplinary, uh, the interdisciplinary, uh, the multidisciplinary team uh, to engage in reflective practice. So these would be doctors, physiotherapists, um, uh, occupational therapists. Um, very often when there are difficulties with patients, it is an opportunity for us to help practitioners reflect um, on their own positionality. And this model has worked really well. Um, so we are seeing um, uh, doctors, for example, being able to reflect on issues of counter transference, being able to reflect on um, the relationship between patient and doctor. Um, also as part of the multidisciplinary team, uh, teams, uh, an emphasis is also placed on resisting the assignment of, gatekeeping, of a gatekeeping role. So very often, for example, in the pain management unit, which is a multimodal form of intervention, meaning that it is an interdisciplinary approach to pain management, which includes psychology, which includes um, the medical doctors, uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, um, dietitian, um, social work. Uh, very often we are then cast in a role where uh, given the stigma associated with psychology, patients are resistant to coming to psychology. They don't necessarily understand why they must see a psychologist when they are presenting with a pain condition. Um, and part of our work is to help patients navigate that, but also not to just dismiss patients. Um, what has happened is that um, from, from, from medical staff or even uh, the allied staff, um, you know, if patients refuse to come to psychology, uh, previously there has been a tendency to sort of uh, um, almost 
treating patients in a way that if they, if they do not um, comply to a teaming psychology, um, they will not be able to get the multimodal um, intervention. And we've had to do a lot of work around that with our colleagues, around the importance of agency for patients, the importance of helping patients navigate this process, how huge it actually is for patients to be referred to psychology, that we should not take that for granted. Um, then we are also engaged in psychological consultation and assessment. This would include neuropsychological assessments, assessments for suitability for medical procedures, assessments for disability grants. Um, and again, uh, we really do try and bring a, a critical spin on this and to use assessment not just as the be and end or to say, for example, that a patient is not suitable for a procedure, but we actually then offer support um, um, if that happens to be, to be the case. An example would, for example, be um, assessment for transplant suitability for renal patients. So if they do not, for example, for whatever reason, um, uh, if they're not found suitable for, for transplant, the psychology uh, uh, unit in, or the counseling psychology um, uh, uh, program offers ongoing support for, for those types of patients um, to manage uh, this chronic condition, to support um, treatment adherence, um, and so on. Um, yeah, so assessments also um, is, is also viewed more holistically. It's almost seen as a gateway to, to offer support and to hopefully also um, create systemic change. Well, I will speak about that later. Okay, then another group of interventions are institutional initiatives uh, that are more or less aligned with the values of uh, counseling or community psychology. So the Department of Health every now and again would come up with um, programs that they want um, units at the hospital to, to run with. And we really see these as great opportunities to uh, make a contribution, specifically as counseling psychologists. Uh, so just some of the examples are, for example, destigmatization training for mental health users uh, for support staff. So this is staff, this is very interesting. So the hospital initiated uh, a, or wanted or asked our department to create programs, destigmatization de programs for support staff, admin, um, and so on, um, security um, around what they perceived would be the, this group of employees' uh, um, tendency to uh, perhaps stigmatize mental health users. So it was very interesting that the stigma, of course, is not just um, around a lack of understanding or lack of exposure. But even doctors can stigmatize mental health users. Um, even psychologists can stigmatize mental health users. So this was a very interesting campaign, but again, uh, it was a very um, important opportunity for counseling psychologists to make a contribution, to reflect um, and problematize the issue of um, mental health users. Um, then the hospital often also has awareness raising campaigns. Um, they, you know, they could be sometimes criticized for being somewhat superficial. We have mental health month, we have this month, we have this month, uh, that month. Um, however, again, it is such a useful opportunity um, to really cast or, or, or sh shine the light on uh, a number of issues that as counseling psychologists um, we, we grapple with um, uh, more specifically. Um, Another campaign, for example, initiated by uh, the Heart of Province was promoting self-advocacy among mental health users. And they termed this, uh, this initiative in, in our own voices. And really just speaking to advocacy work amongst mental health users, um, hearing the voices of mental health users in their own care. Uh, and so again, this is a project that we, we, we ran with. Uh, um, uh, and it's a valuable opportunity for us to collaborate with um, our clinical psychology uh, colleagues 
to have interdisciplinary collaboration. So this is mandated by, by the department. So everybody is expected to participate and you need to show what programs you are running. So for, for us, that's again, like I said, a valuable opportunity uh, to make a contribution, to conscientize um, uh, colleagues around some of the issues that for us are everyday issues um, uh, from a sort of counseling psychology perspective. Um, so we do try to, to, to bring a more critical transformative spin on these initiatives. So for example, um, the, the self-advocacy program, um, where a lot of departments came up with, with, with programs around self-advocacy for mental health users. But one of the issues that we, for example, noticed was that none of these programs included the mental health users themselves. Um, and one of the programs that our department, for example, offered was um, really a day of spending time with uh, mental health users um, via the medium of their artwork. So the clinical psychologist, with the permission of patients, um, had shared some of the artworks of um, mental health users in our campaign, for example, where we could really then see some of the themes that the patients grapple with as inpatients. Um, so again, uh, drawing on a community psychology paradigm around using different vehicles um, to communicate and understanding the power dynamics of only using um, the verbal communication, for example, and how very often um, people uh, are marginalized because they cannot access the modes of communication or because we are using restrictive modes of communication. So this was a wonderful um, opportunity for us to, to, to go into the world of some of our mental health users with more serious um, um, psychiatric conditions. All right, then uh, another group of, 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 of programs or services can be sort of uh, said to be related to um, a request for services by different departments in the hospital. So very often departments would request a trauma debriefing or adverse incident debriefing. And we really see these as opportunities for us to um, make connections with these departments to maybe look at more preventative work. So we are very um, alive to the fact that we are in a hospital where uh, the medical model uh, really dominates. Uh, but we're trying to find spaces in this approach where we can then build relationships by being responsive to those uh, requests, but uh, then also to create spaces for more preventative, more transformative work. So for example, um, during COVID-19, our other renal unit was one of the first units to, to report um, um, a COVID case. And, um, you know, we are sort of um, desensitized to that now, but if we can remember in the beginning, um, it was a really, really uh, um, distressing period. Um, and that was, again, uh, being able to, to offer that assistance, building relationships, and then also then uh, finding that units are then more open to um, more transformative work. And I'll, I'll touch on that later. Then we also have ongoing scheduled debriefing sessions with healthcare providers. Again, this is when, when you know, there, there's a need. So for example, we've had uh, programs with, with psychiatric nurses in, in the psychiatric unit where we would then offer um, debriefing sessions with nurses um, twice a month. Um, and again, that just helps to foster relationships. Also, what we've noticed is that um, there was a tendency for the inpatient unit and the outpatient unit to sort of not speak to each other. This is now in the psychology department itself. And again, these are opportunities for us to, to bridge that gap um, and really, it's, it's in the service of patients to be able to faster collaborate more effectively. 
Then uh, consultation with treatment teams and family members of patients with guarded or poor prognosis. So we've also had um, requests from um, intensive care units, for example, to facilitate um, some kind of dialogue between families and treatment teams. So very often when uh, patients have poor prognosis or guarded prognosis, we find families acting out against hospital staff. Sometimes there are issues around poor treatment um, and so on. And we really they try and see our role as, as almost um, a bit of a mediation. Uh, between doctors and patients to not just dismiss patients. And in this regard, uh, collaborating uh, closely with, um, well, not closely, the hope is that we will be closely, but collaborating with the quality assurance unit. We found that that is an important space where we can um, uh, promote patient advocacy. So again, using those uh, um, issues as, as opportunities, it's obviously not not very pleasant when patients report departments or poor service, but again, we see this opportunity where we can improve services and where we can um, allow patients to have a voice in the treatment, um, in their treatment. All right, um, then the, another group of interventions are sort of grouped under counseling psychology or internship um, initiated programs. So these would be um, programs that are I guess more, more aligned with counseling community psychology, more proactive. Um, and we find the opportunity here as an internship site, we are required to uh, provide interns with an opportunity or exposure to community-based interventions. And um, this is, 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 is a wonderful opportunity once again to um, promote preventative work and transformative work. So the, the, the projects you know, differ in terms of how transformative they are because we also need to be realistic around the constraints uh, working in a, 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 a medical uh, model. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, these are great opportunities for counseling psychologists to uh, give expression to the values of counseling psychology. So what I thought I'd do um, with these uh, programs was to maybe just reflect on some of the um, feedback that we got from um, interns that, that work on these projects. Um, we do ask interns to, um, to, to also, in their write-up of their projects, to also throughout the project keep reflexive journals as is uh, the norm with uh, community-based interventions. So I thought I'd just share some of the thoughts of some of the interns. Also maybe interesting to note that on some of the projects, we actually had joint um, uh, uh, or collaborative uh, projects which included community service psychologists, inter counseling psychologists, and clinical psychologists. Uh, and, and you're really working towards, um, you know, surpassing the nonsense and, and really just looking at how we can offer a service to, to, to our clients or our patients. So one of the interns, for example, in her reflexive notes uh, writes, we got to learn that community psychologists help community members to make meaning of their circumstances through dialogue, however my critique was. How do I help an unemployed, hungry community member to make sense of their current circumstances? I guess this was an indication that I had not understood the principles of community psychology. Through supervision, uh, through supervision, I was able to think about everything that we were doing as interns, relating it back to principles of community psychology, even though there was a bit of resistance from my side. But when I began to see my role as a community psychologist being involved in the community psychology dialogue and lead stigmatization, of mental health training, the meaning making, which was so foreign in the beginning of the year, began to be, to be alive and made sense. I also noticed that once I became more involved in community psychology material, I gained confidence to help others in our training, to think about sensitive discourse such as mental health, while trying to guide particip participants to make meaning of their own fears and anxieties regarding mental health. Understanding concepts and principles of community psychology was helpful in order to engage in a community project. So this was a project that was a dialogue between the hospital 
in the form of the psychology department and certain community members. So these were NGOs from Westbury, which is a, a, a community surrounding the hospital, um, a high school in, in Westbury, the chaplain at Helen Joseph Hospital. And um, just by creating a, a forum where we could uh, understand better the needs of our patient population. Granted that it's a very small, it's a, it's a, a small, it's not representative of, of communities um, entirely, but you can see how the, the, the power of transformation that happens for interns, that, that personal transformation is such an important process in keeping this project or this issue of transformation alive. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Hello. Yes, hi. I think uh, five minutes uh, frozen. Five minutes? All right. Yes. Okay. Um, so let me maybe share another project, which was Gender Matters. So here, um, interns then selected to work with uh, the transgender community. Um, as we may or may not know, um, the transgender community, um, because of stigma, um, are very vulnerable to issues of uh, depression, suicide. Um, and this, this is just another reflection from, from one of the team members. Working with the transgender community came with its own challenges, discomfort and calls for learning. It's cisgender to sexual individuals. We needed to be aware of our privileged position in society in ways that were often difficult to digest. Simultaneously, it was a daunting task to engage with the community that housed resilience and vulnerability in ways that were difficult for us to understand because of our own privilege. Maybe just to make sense of this, this project was incredibly difficult as um, members from the transgender community um, were very reluctant to come forward to work on a hospital-based program. And that in itself spoke to the stigma that they have experienced um, uh, in the public health system by mere fact that uh, they belong to the transgender community. So here, for example, the intercom just speaks around how difficult it was to um, connect with this uh, patient population, but also how difficult it was to get um, medical staff to open up around these issues. Um, I'm just going to rush to the next one. So um, last year, um, we also uh, engaged in the process of trying to also reflect the mirror on ourselves. Um, during October Mental Health Awareness Month, the psychology department then um, uh, initiated a program that looked at um, how uh, healthcare providers are dealing with their own mental health. Um, and so our department, the mental health unit, which consists of psychology, psychiatry, social work, OT nursing, pain unit, renal unit, and the social work department engaged in a series of mental health dialogues. Um, and the COVID pandemic once again just highlighted the mental health care, um, the importance of mental health care, um, you know, among healthcare providers. And this was again uh, such a, a wonderful initiative for. Um, for healthcare providers to also reflect on their own positionality, how they are doing, um, uh, and so on. Um, a program that's currently running is a psychoeducation group that is aimed towards better service uptake and patient empowerment. So the stigma associated with being a mental health user is real. Um, and this, this serves as sometimes a barrier for people to take up psychological services. So counseling psychologists and interns are involved in um, a psychoeducation group that is specifically focused around creating a platform for uh, mental health users to be able to articulate their experience of being referred to psychology, um, being on a waiting list for months and months, um, and how that also is, um, in a way, a, a, such a social injustice towards patients. Um, and so this, this group is used for, for patients to have a voice 
and to um, understand the process better. Uh, very often psychology is acted upon uh, patients without them actually understanding what the process is about. Looking for, we're also currently involved in promoting mental health amongst intern doctors and specifically the internal medicine department and psychiatry department. And here we're working towards a more reflective practitioner model uh, for doctors. So um, we know around issues of uh, treatment of patients, miscommunication between doctors and patients, but also understanding that this uh, public health is not easy for doctors. Um, and so we're hoping to uh, create a reflective space with, with intern doctors. So this is a program that is currently running. Um, there's also research collaboration happening. So we, we published um, a study on, on just the quality of life with the patients, uh, renal patients. Um, and here, again, the issues of marginalization is huge. That in public service, patients don't have a choice as to what type of renal treatment they can choose, right? So very often they are, they have to accept what is peritoneal dialysis, which is a sort of home dialysis as opposed to hemodialysis, which happens in the hospital. And here again, um, just being able to support patients in, in that regard. Uh, future research interventions or possibilities. Um, and here we're really looking at more, sorry, that's not laboratory, which was meant to be laboratory, uh, laboratory. Approaches. Uh, so the interaction between chronic conditions, race, and socioeconomic status, uh, and then also patient advocacy, access to renal care, adverse consequences associated with chronic pain. So we find that a lot of chronic pain patients uh, end up in a spiral of um, just a spiral of, of poor functioning uh, because many of them lose their jobs. Uh, in many cases, uh, illegally so, where um, uh, huge corporations are not willing to accommodate patients with chronic pain conditions, um, from huge corporations to, for example, domestic workers. Many of our patients are domestic workers who are just uh, summarily fired because they cannot perform the same tasks that they used to. So we're looking at this as, as perhaps in future um, areas of, of patient advocacy. Um, in the department. Then I just want to end off with some challenges and opportunities. Um, I think um, the reality now is that there aren't many posts available in public service, but um, collaboration is critical. So uh, we have, for example, the University of Johannesburg, the students come over and they do some uh, uh, assessments with us in therapy. So service learning is an opportunity where as counseling psychologists, we can insert ourselves in the public health system. Uh, collaborating with NGOs in the private sector, also just collaboration across registration categories. So wherever you find yourself, whether it's in private, whether it's an NGO, um, collaboration is, is such a foundational principle of, of uh, uh, community psychology and I think it really will help us to insert ourselves in the public health system. Also to see crisis as opportunity, you, you may be aware that um, during the COVID pandemic and also when uh, um, uh, Charlotte Monteco Hospital, uh, there was a fire and Hannah Joseph Hospital was inundated with, with, with mental health users and the counseling psychology program was, was called upon to, to provide some interventions. And, uh, you know, we, we readily had tools to, to um, accommodate those patients. Um, so limited employment opportunities for counseling psychologists is, is a challenge. Um, we don't know what the NHI holds for us, but again, it might be an opportunity. And then I also just want to close up by saying that the public health also has a huge role to play in developing psychologists, but also counseling psychologists uh, specifically. Um, uh, just, I think just by, by looking at the kind of areas of work that counseling psychologists are involved with, really see how working in public service can really give expression to, to those values that we hold so dear as, as counseling and uh, community psychologists. All right, so that's, that's where I'll end. Okay, thank you for Rosa. Um, thank you for that. I think it's uh, what you've covered is a is a wide 
wide area in some areas that I never thought um, I never thought of um, counseling psychologists working in um, and the type of work. So I think this uh, this links uh, a little bit, probably even more than a little bit, to to what Irvalt was speaking about in terms of working in education and the kinds of work that we are able to uh, to do as counseling psychologists in the public health sector. So thank you again to both of you um, for your presentations. And what I will do is that I will I will just ask, uh, I'll take about, I've got two questions, uh, more than two questions in the Q&A, in the chat box. Um, and some of them I'll just try and sort of put them into one and so that we can uh, address them um, and, and see what we can do. So maybe I'll start with, uh, with a question that seems to be for both, um, for both your, uh, for Rosa and Ewald, um, and you can, you can take it at will. Uh, so, um, so there was a question first that was asked to hear about, but then it came up again in a different way about the the work counseling psychologists in both your settings, working with uh, NGOs and registered counselors also to help fill the gap. Uh, has there been some work, some some way to collaborate with registered counselors uh, in any of your settings? Uh, I know that the prior to my employment department, there was um, there was a, a sort of a service learning um, agreement uh, with with I think one of the private institutes actually. Um, um, well, it was also uh, universities are not offering the register council people. So yeah, there was there was a time when, when that was the case, um, but it was before I was at the hospital. But again, yes, it's definitely. Um, an opportunity missed, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, oh, There we go. I was trying to unmute myself. So, yes, actually, I just pulled up our, our spreadsheet over here. So, we currently have 38 uh, registered counselors employed by the WCB. They predominantly work in schools of skills, special schools, and they offer um, short-term therapeutic interventions for, uh, you know, 14 to 18-year-old learners. That's the, our client group for um, school of skills. Okay. Oh, so, uh, yeah, I guess uh, for, for the two people who had asked that question, uh, one had asked a very direct question to you about, about whether there's a role for registered counselors. And there was a question, uh, maybe I'll take then the more specific questions to you, Eval. Yeah. Um, if there's a role for psychometrists uh, within the WCED. Yeah. And maybe the same question to you, Farosa, as, as well, uh, uh, psychometrists. So I did try to respond to the, uh, the person who asked that question directly. Um, I think if we take a look at the role of psychometry, uh, previously, the focus in the education department was very much about testing, identifying where the need is, and then placing a child within a special school environment. Like a real active role for a psychometrist. However, what has now happened is that there's been a major move away from testing as the only measure to quantify need. Uh, we've got a the CS policy, which is a screening, identification, assessment, and support. It's a big policy. Anybody interested in applying for uh, for a position in education? That's your source document to reference in your applications. So we've seen a move away from testing and really looking at assessment. And I think uh, because we are focusing on the counseling aspect, the psychometry role has become very minimal within the education department. We still have psychometrists. We've got a couple of psychometrists uh, at the department of, Prem of the premier, but more working towards the um, adult population groups, not really within the, the child population. Okay, uh, Feroza, for, for you, in terms of the, the hospital settings, um, 
have you seen the uh, maybe not a need, but have you seen the role of psychometrists being sort of enhanced? Yes, no, just, just practically, it's, it's not happening, but again, I think they, they, they give a behavioral, especially in um, children's hospitals, um, you know, we, um, you know, uh, education is still such an important part of the development, but also with young adults, um, um, you know, assessment, um, there's a way of, yeah, not as a definitive sort of, this is the answer and now, you know, this is, this is your fit, but really as, as an opportunity for self-exploration um, amongst our patients, especially amongst our uh, children that are hospitalized for long periods of time and so on. You know, these sort of things like career development and so on is, is not really taken up seriously. Um, and, and these opportunities um, that we uh, psychometrists could, for example, play a role. Oh, all right. Uh, so let me also ask some questions. I see people are having uh, some conversations there in the Q and A. But but I sort of wondered, I guess, about um, uh, about a couple of things as you both were presenting, and and one of them I think has to do with with sort of the the early career counseling psychologists. And there was a little bit of a contrast between uh, between the two, your both your presentations, where Ewald was saying there's quite a lot of opportunity within the Western Cape Education Department. And for Rosa, you had mentioned that actually for counseling psychologists in the health system in Gauteng, at least, there seems to be dwindling. And, and in my head, I had also Ewald saying, you need to tailor your CV. And I guess I'm sort of asking the question, well, do I apply for, for a job that says clinical psychologist, but I can see that it is within my competencies that I tailor my CV, I guess, to say, well, I actually am competent in this thing. Um, whoever's HR is making the decisions that they want clinical, um, actually doesn't quite understand the differentiation. So would you advise early career, even some people who are not early, early career and who want to make the switch into public service uh, to sort of do that kind of thing? Uh, any one of you can start. I don't think you have anything to add to that. Um, um, I think it's just it's just good common sense to 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 tailor make I and mean, I agree that it's you know it sounds like a simple thing, but um to to tailor make your CV to each and every post is, is incredibly important. And we do pick that up with with, with recruitment that um, people do not do that. Um, as far as 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 <laughs> You know, applying for a post that specifically says clinical psychologist. Um, I've tried and I've never got any answers. So, um, but I, I still think it's worth a try. I think it's worth a try. Uh, but I think our 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 intervention or our our change the locality of where change would happen is to query that that notion that why is the clinical psychology post so also just to know that with the with the government the occupational specific dispensation which is now taking a closer look at each profession and understanding that people can progress um, in their professions not necessarily to a level of management but a specialist level has opened a gateway for other registrations to come in and i think yes this this is going this is going to to mean legal action that we that we query this notion of um you know this is my skill set but by mere just definition that i'm not a clinical psychologist i am not even considered for the position uh, but I think um, we are, yeah, we, we can take a chance, but it's very easy, easy for HR to just say, is your MA clinical certificate there? No, you don't even get considered. That's the reality of what happened. Mm -hmm. 
may mm -hmm. offer a different perspective from education. So the education services need to offer a range of services for a child across the child's span of access to education. It's not a single point of entry. It's not only at the hospital, but it's ensuring this child with challenges, with difficulties, can access psychological services throughout his journey or his or her journey. So we've, we've removed that, uh, the prerequisite to have a education, uh, educational psychology uh, qualification when you move into education. What we are looking for is at least an application of the psychological skill set towards our client population. So if you are a, a clinical psychologist applying for a position in the, the Western Cape Education Department, what you need to do is you need to demonstrate what you've done previously actually links with children going to school. That, that's relevant. Showing how you've supported a child on the, um, with ASD, for example, to think about you know, possibilities to overcome barriers. Uh, you know, that's kind of what we want to see. The, the registration category, we don't have enough psychologists in this country to support the children in need. So it's, it's really about demonstrating the way that you can support those kids and at least referencing that in your CV. What we see uh, as soon as we get down to shortlisting, remember, especially if you are not known um, you know, to the people sitting around the table, your, your CV speaks to who you are as a person. And if in the advert they say that this person uh, who we are employing needs to demonstrate uh, the ability to write an inclusive you know, education plan, at least have somewhere in your CV talking about your ability to write an inclusive education plan. Um, we, we welcome opportunity for people. Um, I think what we, we need to realize is that sometimes you have to venture into the world of contract employment to gain experience before a permanent opportunity will avail itself. Uh, I did point to this, this fact earlier on. It took me 10 years before I got permanent employment. So 10 years of contract work, different types of experiences that I was able to put together and say, all right, so now I'm ready. But it was all worthwhile experiences. Now, I mean, uh, part of, I guess, uh, sort of reflecting with what, with what you are both saying and, and more so because you are speaking about the, the education sector and there's been a little bit of recognition. There's just not enough for you to be picking and choosing between uh, purple grapes and, and green grapes. Just take grapes. They're all grapes. But there's a, there's a little bit of a problem, I guess, because uh, we're talking about two provinces here and, and where... Um, where the largest contingent of psychologists are based, the Western Cape and, and Gauteng, that that change hasn't quite happened. And for us, you, you sort of speaking about, it seems to be starting, but might require a little bit more activism on our part okay. as the psychologists who actually say, actually, what you are looking for is a psychologist who has a master's degree and not really a specific registration category because this is not for example psychiatric work or this is not work in in this sort of uh in this sort of area okay um so maybe to just give you both the one one sort of specific question um Ewald, i think um i, I think a, a question maybe uh, as sort of as a last one you had mentioned something about uh, the sort of government departments when you were starting out and they didn't quite know what psychologists did. Uh, and I have in my head, uh, uh, Prof. Seth Cooper in a t television interview just blatantly said, they don't know what psychologists do. So have you found though that they've gotten better? Um, that, uh, that government has gotten better in understanding the role of psychologists um, and what psychologists can offer? So I think our challenge, and this I've experienced in, in um, Western Cape Education Department, but also within the Ministry of Education in New Zealand, is that the people that talk to the work that psychologists uh, need to do in the field are not psychologists. And it is a, uh, it's a watershed moment where 
we I realized that really for us to to affect the change that we need, we need to start positioning ourselves into you know platforms where a contribution that we make can be actually heard by the people who are making the decisions. It's a slow process. It takes time. It's helping people to understand how this fuzzy world of psychology that we work in can be quantified and help solve real world problems. Uh, a big, big problem that we have as psychologists is we are long winded. We say a lot. There's a whole lot of fuzziness when it comes to explaining problems to people. And that doesn't work in government. In government, it's all about there's a need. We've got funding. Can we provide the funding? Help clarify the details. And that is where psychologists have to change the way that we approach government sectors um, and start thinking about providing a service that actually provides a, a real world um, solution to the problems experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think what you what you're saying is important. I mean, uh, government officials don't want to hear us blabbering on about symptomatology and all our fancy psychoanalysis. They don't care. Uh, it's like, can you attend to this? Can I give you money? Go do that. Uh, sort of conversation. Yeah. 65 million that has become available from a specific fund. This needs to go to children on the autism spectrum. How do we appropriately use the funds? Where do we send the funds to the most mm -hmm. uh, children most in need? Answer mm -hmm. that question. Not mm -hmm. with a theoretical approach, but with real world examples. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you you raise you raise also an important thing about what are we teaching uh, or training our students to do around sort of being able to to speak to various stakeholders uh, about how do you clearly send a message to people who have money or who who are able to open certain doors so that you are able to do the work, and I guess uh, your image there of when you google psychology i mean apart from freud coming up all the time those are the images that come up it's people sitting with their notepads and it's not really what we might need uh in in the country and, and i'm sure for us we speak a lot, we've spoken a lot about community engaged interventions we talk a lot about advocacy there and i think that's an important message for all of us to embrace these kinds of values that we have which advocacy is a part of the counseling psychology values um, so that we can be able to intervene rather than waiting for government to do things because they don't know what we're talking about in one sense. So thank you, Evel. I think uh, for Rosa, just um, as a final question to you, um, I mean, the, the multidisciplinary teams, and you spoke a little bit about it, um, uh, about sort of the role that you as a psychologist play in those multidisciplinary teams. And I was wondering if uh, working in multidisciplinary teams has enhanced you as a, as a professional and how you work and how you think uh, in any way. Yes, 100%. And I think that, that was sort of my final sort of reflection, just the role of, of also the public health sector in developing psychologists. Uh, the fact that, you know, in no other space are you going to have that privilege of having all of these, having this interdisciplinary dialogue happening on a week by week basis. Um, you know, that is so important, I think, even for psychologists who go into private practice um, in terms of our uh, competency development. So yes, I think that has really uh, made a huge impact. I think it's, it's a a great learning opportunity, not just for uh, the most, but, you know, for, for 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 psychologists, but likewise also for the medical staff. Um, um, very often, we we do in those spaces become the voice of the patients. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 critical, um, and which really speaks to just um, how unfortunate it is that that. Um, so few of our, our interns get that exposure, you know, they might not necessarily want to work there, but um, just in terms of competency development, it's a huge, um, it's a huge opportunity for learning. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, some of us who are lucky enough to, to be training uh, students who, from their M1, are working in the public sector, I think it has been absolutely invaluable for them in that kind of exposure um, that, you know, psychology doesn't look like pen and pad. Sometimes people just, uh, the things that we tell them in class and what they are seeing can be uh, quite different. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to offer you both uh, an opportunity to give some last reflections if you have any um, uh, on a way forward. I know, Ewald, you, you've been pushing now for, uh, for, for a month or so some positions in the, <laughs> in the WCED, uh, which is really great. Um, so just any last sort of uh, words of remarks uh, from both of you, and I'll, I'll take you, uh, Ewald, first. We're pretty selfish down here in the Western Cape. We want people to apply for the positions. Uh, it is incredibly frustrating to sit with a shortlisting panel and not having uh, you know, enough applications or a simple mistake, like not having a SACE you know, application in process disqualifies people. So please just, again, as I say, I welcome engagement with people. We're looking forward to receiving your applications. It's a wonderful position. It offers so much opportunity for you to actually guide your service. It's not a prescriptive service. So you bring to the table your key strings. Um, and yeah, uh, really welcome any engagement from, from people here. Uh, for Rosa? Um, yeah, just, just thank you, Ewald, and just thank you, uh, Sipo, for, for this invitation. I think these kind of um, meetings are, are so important uh, for us to um, be together with like-minded individuals, and we do find them in different spaces. So I think to also let go of those self-imposed barriers. Um, we've had comments from doctors who would ask, why don't we have counsellors? doing trauma debriefing, yes, why don't we? Um, you know, so they don't see this, this registration. They, I've never been asked what kind of psychologist are you? Um, so, um, although I, 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 I emphasize with interns, you must put very boldly that you are a counseling psychologist because we want them to ask what kind of psychologist you are so that we can put um, those very important issues on the agenda. So yeah, I guess just for, for us to, to move forward and look for the spaces and, and yeah, just by having this get together, just by meeting Evolve this evening, I think most of us on this, this, this chat <laughs> is, was such an eye opener that, that these opportunities exist. Yes. Okay. I'd, I'd like to thank both of you for coming on, for taking your time. Um, to, to come speak to us about your, your wealth of experience, uh, really eye-opening. I'm sure many people uh, on tonight uh, have shared similar sentiments in the chat that this has been really eye-opening and really engaging and thinking about um, not only what's to come, but how we may enhance our own role as counseling psychologists within sort of the tapestry of health or mental health services. And I'm really grateful on behalf of uh, the South African Association of Counseling Psychologists for your time and really engaging presentations. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you who've joined us tonight. It was such a fantastic turnout. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Braving load shedding schedules, um, as frustrating as they can be. Really grateful that you were able to join us and would like to reiterate again as both speakers have spoken about a need for advocacy and the channel to do so is available, which is the division for you to please join the division. Please nominate yourself or others to be the executive of the division at the next AGM coming up now in 2023 to please get involved. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and it cannot just be Ewald in the Western Cape, Rosa doing it at Lynn Joseph. It needs all of us to band together to try and find a way forward. So really grateful for all of you tonight. Uh, the CPD form is available on the chat. So you just click it, you fill it out and uh, your CPD points will come to you. Uh, so both you Ewald and Rosa, also please just click on there. 
so that you can get your CPD course. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your night and rest of the week. Thank you so much.